be very, very unlikely. So based on that, we've clinically excluded the PE. So what do we think might be going on? Tell me if stuff pops up in the chat, Anoush, because I think yeah. the chat might have frozen for me. So yeah, it could be a panic attack, I guess, yeah. Yeah, good. So you always want to keep psychological causes in mind. That's really, really yeah. important. But remember, those, those are diagnoses of exclusion. Anything else? Myocardial infarction. Okay. Anemia. Anemia, yeah, it's a good shout. Uh, MI, MI is very uncommon in this age group. Um, actually, if somebody in this age group gets an MI, slight tangent, what's the most likely okay. cause of an MI in this age group? I'm just going to take control of the slide, sorry. Yep, that's fine. Occam. What was that? Occam. Oh, yeah. If it's a 32-year-old and it turns out they've got an MI, is it going to be a thrombus? Or, you know, can, if they, yeah, is it, going, is it likely to be a, a thrombus, a plaque? And if it's not, what's the likely mechanism going to be if somebody has an MI, age 32? Unlikely, yeah. Yep, it's unlikely. So what would be the likely mechanism if somebody does if a 32 year old does actually have an MI, you do their ECG and they've got evidence of a STEMI on the ECG. What's the likely mechanism in a 32 year old? Seeing as we've said that a, throm that a thrombus is unlikely. Uh, not quite AS, so AS is more likely to cause things like stroke. Yep. Genital, yeah, so congenital problems are quite likely. Yeah. Poppers and Viagra, love that. Actually, that's not, like, completely untrue. Mm -hmm. What was the first one? That they Gen said? No, 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 as in before right. Viagra. Poppers. Poppers. Getting closer. Harder than poppers. Okay. Harder than some, did someone say cocaine? Yeah, they did. Wonderful. Yeah, cocaine is the most likely cause if somebody has come in with an MI. Uh, definitely at the Whittington. <laughs> um, but yeah, so coronary vasospasm is the most likely mechanism of a myocardial infarction in somebody who is below the age that you'd expect a thrombus. So if it's somebody in the... I mean, if, for example, there's a history of familial hyperlipidemia, then... Yeah, good chance it's actually a thrombotic MI because of their high cholesterol levels. But if it's somebody without any family history of a condition like that, and they've come in with evidence of an MI, there's a good chance they've taken something which induces vasospasm. Cocaine is the most common example that you'll see in an, uh, in an a and &E. There are some other drugs which induce vasospasm, but cocaine is the one that you want to think about. Okay, so... Sorry, that was a tangent about MIs and young people. So we think it's un unlikely to be an MI in her. Uh, let's say she's denied denied any recreational drug use. Um, what else might be causing symptoms like this? So we've mentioned an anxiety attack, which is feasible, but we want to exclude physical causes beforehand. What else could cause somebody to present with Ms. Amidala's presentation? So palpitations, 
a heart rate of 150 beats per minute, sense of shortness of breath. Somebody mentioned anemia, which was good as well. Really severe anemia can present like this. Can you see the chat, sorry? I cannot see the chat, so you're going to have to read it out for me. Uh, so people are saying Wolf Parkinson White, arrhythmias. Yep. So, yeah. So given that you've said that we're going to talk about arrhythmias, perfect. An arrhythmia is something you want to look, you want to do. So you're going to do your ECG. And you do your ECG. And if the slide moves on. Yeah, this is your ECG. What's the CCG showing? And also somebody tell me what's happening in V5. What? So tall tenting, you wave. Okay, yeah. So you could say that in the anterior leads, they're a bit tented. Yep. But it's not, it's not consistent throughout the leads, so it's unlikely to be yep. something like hyperkalemia. Yeah. Because you'd be looking for consistency for that. Lutter. What was that? Lutter. OK. So the thing with flutter is you're looking for your jagged sawtooth uh, pattern. And we have an ECG of flutter later on. So whilst it's a good shout, it's a fairly distinctive ECG. Uh, um, we'll, SVT. I'll show you Wonderful. This is a supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, I want to bring your attention to the fact that there are technically no P waves here. That's the that's probably the biggest giveaway that this is a supraventricular tachycardia. There are any P waves. Also, that it's a tachycardia, so it's about 150 beats per minute. Um, before I move on, what do people think is happening in V5? You worried about that? Scared? You okay with that? Inspiration. So, inspiration is a good shout, but it wouldn't cause as dramatic a change in baseline as that. So something with the skin. inspiration. Poor connection with the skin can do it. Chances are she's she's fidgeted um, towards the towards the end of that. Though poor connection of the skin is also probably very likely because you can see it's only in V5. So the V5 lead has probably moved around a bit. So the yeah. So that's an artifact. You de that's not anything to worry about. It's just to do with the fact that the lead has slightly come off during that. OK. So like you said, the likely diagnosis is a supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, something to mention is that this is an umbrella term. Uh, for any regular tachyarrhythmia, that originates above the ventricles, as the name alludes to. This includes things like sinus tachy, atrial flutter, and your atrioventricular tachycardias. So just to distinguish, because it's a bit annoying, you've got your atrioventricular node reentry tachycardias. Those are the ones which go through the atrioventricular node, then loop back and sort of form a cycle. So they involve the atrioventricular node. This ECG, which you just saw as an example of that, an atrioventricular reentry tachycardia does not involve the atrioventricular node as well. It involves accessory pathways, which Wolf Parkinson White syndrome is an example of. So there's an accessory pathway that bypasses the AVM and the impulses are going from atria to ventricle, back to, from ventricle to atria, forming a loop, completely bypassing the atrioventricular node, which is why any medication which tar targets the atrioventricular node isn't particularly effective in these cases. In terms of an ECG, it's regular with a narrow QRS, so under 120 milliseconds, and P waves are absent. Apart from sinus tachycardia, the sinus tachy it's counted it counted in SVT, but it's not really an arrhythmia because it's regular. There's no yeah, there's there are P waves. It's just a normal heart rate when but it's sorry, it's a normal sinus pattern just as a tachycardia. So the main takeaway is narrow com narrow complex tachycardia with new, no P waves is an S SVT. 
why can't we leave them untreated? What's the problem with an SVT if it carries on? Can it lead to VTAC? They can. So what they can do is they can degenerate into a ventricular tachycardia if they get, yeah. But Even let's say- dynamic instability? Wonderful, yeah. Why does it, why would it cause hemodynamic instability if left alone? Not sustainable, so heart will tire. Yeah, that's one of the reasons. Yep. Low ventricular filling, yeah, that's the other big reason. Perfect, yeah. yeah. So that's, cardiac output. Yeah, perfect. So it'll eventually lead to cardiogenic shock. And the reason behind that is if you've got a heart rate of, let's say, 150 beats per minute, you have no time for diastole. The heart is contracting so fast that there is no time for it to fill that will lead to a decreased preload and eventually your card your stroke volume is just going to completely tail off and they'll go into cardiogenic shock you need time for diastole in order to maintain a cardiac output so a very very high fast rate over a long period of time that's what makes it dangerous it can degenerate into a ventricular tachycardia yep but if it doesn't it's still dangerous because eventually their cardiac output will ta taper off and they'll go into cardiogenic shock okay so just quickly go to go over the sort of pathophysiology side of things because both Anush and I are firm believers that if you go back to the base principles and understand the physiology that lets you understand the, pharm the pharmacology and it makes the clinical side of things easier to remember. So remember you've got your sonar atrial node sitting in your right atrium, impulses pass over the atria, you get to your atrioventricular node, what's the one or probably the most important feature of the atrioventricular node in terms of its relevance to the cardiac electrophysiology. It does something which is really important and necessary for ventricular filling to happen. Slows down the conduction and it introduces this AV delay. Exactly. Perfect, yeah. So the AV delays is the really important job of the atrioventricular node. After that, you've got your bundle of his, which is very short, splits into your left and right bundles, and those go down to the apex, and then they taper off into your Purkinje fibers, which uh, supply the ventricles. So if I just quickly remind you guys of the electrophysiology of the cardiomyocytes, particularly the pacemakers, pacemakers, this is really, really relevant to the pharmacology. Because if you understand what channels are involved and what ions are involved in different parts of the cardiac cycle, it makes sense. The, it, the drugs that are used to treat arrhythmias make more sense. So if you look at the pacemaker side of things, for example, remember you have your funny current, which is a constant tonic influx of sodium ions, which once it reaches a depolarization threshold, you have opening of very, very rapid L-type calcium channels. That causes your spike. Once that re reaches the depolarization potential, your calcium channels open, you repolarize. So remember, part of the sinus, the probably one, the most important part of sinus uh, impulse generation is that opening of the calcium channels to cause the spike, as well as the funny current. And you need repolarization with potassium. At the bottom here, you've got the, the channels involved. Meanwhile, with the ventricles, the depolarization spike is caused by sodium instead of potassium. And remember, you've got your plateau phase. So your plateau phase, you've got an influx of calcium, which is being opposed by efflux of potassium. So they kind of balance out. You get a bit of a plateau until the calcium channels shut. And then you've got unopposed potassium action that drops that, that repolarizes back to the resting potential. If there are any questions about that, just put that into the chat and Anusha and I can answer them. But yeah, the reason that's relevant is you've got your, your 
anti-dysrhythmic drugs. I have to say, don't memorize the Vaughan Williams classification. We've just put it here to tie it back into the relevance of the pharmacology. But you've got your different classes, your class one sodium channel blockers, your class two, which are your beta blockers, class three, which are your potassium channel blockers, and class four, which are your calcium channel blockers. If we look at the ways that these can terminate arrhythmias if you've got for example your sodium channel blo sodium channel blockers which prevent at least in the cardiomyocytes the depolarization spike so preventing that can slow the heart rate down class two your beta blockers remember sympathetic innervation goes to both the sinoatrial and the atrioventricular nodes it's both chronotropic and ionotropic over here we care about the chronotropic or the controlling of heart rate side of things where beta blocker will slow that down. If you slow down the arrhythmia, the main benefit, like we said, gives more time for diastole, so reduces the chance of the person going to cardiogenic shock, but also, um, well, actually, that's the most important part, really, because that's a whole concept of rate control. That's why we use beta blocker for rate control in AF. Your potassium channel blockers are really, really useful, particularly in the nodes, because they decrease, uh, they lengthen out the action potential by increasing the time needed for repolarization. So they widen the duration of the action potential, so also slow things down. And they're particularly important in the ventricles. In fact, they're very, very effective in the ventricles. And your calcium channel blockers, remember, in your sinoatrial node will reduce the, the intensity of the depolarization spike, but also will lengthen out the plateau phase. So they will also increase the duration of the action potential. Any questions about that in terms of the pharmacology? I am of the very, very strong opinion that pharmacology is to be understood and not to be memorized. You can memorize it, but I think it's far, far easier for you guys if you look at pharmacology, applied physiology. Was that? Yeah, spend some time learning it. Yeah. Now that you have this much time in quarantine. Yeah. Yeah, if you look at it as applied physiology rather than something like anatomy to just be memorized, which needs to be memorized, because it really, really can be understood, and I think it's really, really useful. It makes your life a lot easier because you can work think. Pardon me, you can work things out rather than um, having to rely entirely on memory. But yeah, any questions about the pharmacology? Let us know. We can answer that. No. So. <laughs> Okay, so that brings us to the first SBA. So you've got Miss Amidala, you've got an SVT, specifically an atrioventricular nodal reentry tachycardia. What do you think the single best, best management option for Miss Amidala is? Do we give her amiodarone, 300 milligrams IV? Do we give her oral flaconide instant release, which is 50 milligrams? Do we give her six milligrams of adenosine intravenously? Do we give her five milligrams of metoprolol intravenously, or do we initiate vasovagal maneuvers? Everyone has gone with E. Wonderful. Can someone, does someone want to explain what vasovagal maneuvers actually are? Because it's an easy name to remember, but actually breaking it down into what it actually means is quite useful, I think. Or an example of a vasovagal. Yeah, examples are good as well. Exhaling against a closed glottis. Good, fantastic. So that's the Valsalva maneuver. Yeah. And the other one, which isn't used particularly yeah. frequently because we don't like it. Wait, have they? Has someone said carotid it? Carotid sinus massage. Perfect. Yeah. So your carotid sinus massage. Remember, the whole principle of all of this is activation of the vagus nerve. So you can either do that by the carotid sinus massage or you can do that with the Valsalva maneuver. Or another method, for example, is plunging your face into really, really cold water. Anything which activates the parasympathetic, the parasympathetic nervous system supplied to the heart is a vasovagal maneuver. And they're really, really useful in this case because the vagus nerve slows down the heart rate. Again, like we said, useful because increases time for diastole. And in the case of supraventricular tachycardias can actually reverse them entirely. So the classic example, so yeah, all of you who went for E, completely right. The classic example is you give somebody a syringe, five millimeter syringe, and you ask them to blow into it, blow into it. There's resistance, they're essentially breathing against a closed glottis, that's creating Valsalva maneuver, and that can reverse a supraventricular tachycardia. 
So we've gone through va why vasovagal maneuvers, uh, and that's your first line. After that, you've got your 6-12-12 rule, which is adenosine, um, 6 milligrams initially, then 12 mil milligrams, 12 milligrams again. If that doesn't respond, you might want to bleep the cardiology edge, and you've also got the option of giving them 5 to 10 milligrams of ver verapamil, so calcium channel blocker intravenously. If they're not responding to vasovagal maneuvers and pharmacological cardioversion, usually that indicates there's an underlying atrial arrhythmia, something like flutter or fibrillation. Before I move on to adenosine, just want to ask, when you give somebody adenosine, what would you want to tell the patient? Good clinical practice. Uh, more than, yeah, pain is probably the wrong description, but yeah, crushing feeling in the chest. Yeah. They you might feel that. like you, you're going to die. Yeah. It's like this yeah. feeling of impending doom. That, exactly. You want to warn the patient of that because it is a really, really, really scary thing. So at least if they can expect it, then that makes it slightly better. Um, as well as this, why, what's the actual point of you? using adenosine in a AVNRT, why does it work? Does anyone, anyone have any idea in terms of that? Again, this is going back to pharmacology being applied physiology. It inhibits AV node. Yeah, perfect. So there are adenosine 1 receptors. So these are GPCRs found in the AV node. Because they've got an inhibitory G protein unit, they inhibit adenyl cyclase, camp levels go down. This type of polarizes the cell, essentially inhibits uh, calcium, calcium currents. And remember, in nodal tissue, calcium is the one that causes a depolarization spike. This causes a temporary atrioventricular node block which is really useful in AVNRTs because they cycle through the AV node. The reason why they get a sense of intent, impending doom actually is because um, it causes a tra uh, transient asystole. So the person's brain registers that the heart's actually just stopped, which as you can imagine, <laughs> is a fairly terrifying sensation. Um, can we give adenosine orally? Why do we have to give it IV? Short half-life. Perfect. It's got a half-life of about 30 seconds. If you give it orally, it will not, it will not make it. So IV adenosine. Okay. So you've given her adenosine, and this is Miss Amidala's ECG now. So what's that showing? Why does the ECG disappeared for me? Sorry, one second. I'm just, uh, someone is struggling to get in. Ah, yes, I can see the chat again, I think. Or is it, l is it late again? Can you see the, uh, yeah, so this, this is your, uh, this is flutter. Yeah, perfect. So this is, yeah, exactly. So this is atrial flutter. So if you notice, these were the sawtooth patterns I was talking about. If you look at them, they're in, uh, they're in, um, these lead to the bottom left, so you can see them in AVF, you can see them in lead three. So there are multiple of those for every for every QRS complex. In this case, there are two uh, sawtooth complexes for every QRS. So this can be classified as a, a two to one atrial flutter. So flutter is managed in pretty much the same way as AF. AF is far more common though, it's the most common arrhythmia. Just before I go on, does anybody want clarification on, because we call flutter regularly irregular arrhythmia and AF irregularly, irregular and irregularly irregular arrhythmia. Is everyone okay with the difference between those? Uh, can we go over it? Yeah, sure. So if we go back to the slide on on uh, 
the ECG with Flutter. Uh, let me see. Yeah. So you can see here that the QRS complexes are regular. That's the regular aspect. So their heartbeat, the the actual cardiac output aspect, the ventricular rhythm is regular. The problem is the atria aren't behaving regularly. They've got two. The there's not a regular conduction through the atrioventricular node. So conduction is irregular, but the actual heart rate itself is regular. There's no problems with that. You could still calculate a heart rate using your 300 divided by big squares rule, for example. If we looked at AF though, conduction is completely irregular and the actual ventricular rate is irregular as well. That's what differentiates flutter from fibrillation. Flutter, you will have a regular heart rate, but conduction is not regular. Fibrillation, you will have both. Does that make sense? Why is it two to one, not three to one? You can you can you can get three to one as well. It depends on the no, patient. No, that specific one. Oh, that specific one. Cool. Uh, so it looks like three. To, it, I can see why it looks like three to one. But the first complex you're seeing is actually the T wave after the QRS. So there are two of the jagged P wave complexes. So you can see P wave one, P wave two, and then your QRS. That's your T wave. P wave one, P wave two, QRS. Everyone good with that? Sick. Okay. So we pathophysiology is not entirely clear. There is a bit of evidence suggesting that aberrant excitation from the pulmonary veins plays a role, and that's actually uh, something that is used to determine some of the last resort treatments, actually. Bear in mind that the atrial arrhythmias can both be tachyarrhythmias or bradyarrhythmias, and the management is actually different depending on which one it is. So we've moved on to our second case. This is Mr. A. Sepkowski. He's a 71-year-old man, and he's presented to his GP. So in this case, you are the GP now. Uh, he's complaining of palpitations, and he's feeling quite tired. And this has been going on for about three months now. Um, but it's gotten to the point where it's really bothering him, so he's decided to come in. He's got a past medical history of osteoarthritis, asthma, and type 2 diabetes. He's not allergic to any medications, but he's taking paracetamol regularly. Uh, he's got a serotide inhaler, um, which he's taking two puffs off twice a day. Remember, serotide is your combined long-acting beta agonist, so salmeterol and your inhaled corticosteroid, in this case, fluticasone. He's taking metformin, 500 milligrams twice a day, and he's got his salbutamol inhaler uh, as a rescue inhaler for when he needs it. He's a semi-retired author. He says that he quite likes his vodka, going through a couple of bottles a week. When you examine him, his pulse is irregularly irregular. It's difficult to calculate a heart rate. You put him on the blood pressure machine, which gives you a pulse for 102. Be a bit skeptical of those because in an irregularly uh, irregular, with an irregularly irregular pulse, it can be quite difficult to calculate a heart rate. But usually you rely on feel. It can, based on feel, you can usually tell this is quite fast. This doesn't seem abnormal in terms of rate. This is quite slow. But yeah, so it's a, it's a ta tachycardic AF. You can't find any other abnormalities. You're in one of the lovely GP clinics, which actually is well equipped and has an ECG machine, and you can confirm the AF on ECG. And he denies any syncopal or presyncopal features. He's not dizzy. He doesn't feel faint when he stands up from sitting down, doesn't have any sort of visual disturbances when he stands up from sitting down. So you haven't got that side of things to worry about. So this brings us on to the second SBA. So oh, no, sorry, before that, just an example of a pulse with AF. Sorry, an ECG with AF. So remember, you've got no P waves. At, at, so conduction is irregular and your, vent, your ventricular rate is irregular as well. They are not spaced out equally. If your, if your ventricular rate is not regular, then that, that's AF. That's what you're looking for in AF. Are the QRS complexes spaced out regularly? Are there P waves? No P waves and no regularity between QRS complexes is AF. Um, and V1. V1 oddly looks like flutter, weirdly enough. It's not flutter, 
but because it's irregular, as you can see, you've got your QRS here, your QRS here, and then a longer gap to your QRS here. They, but I honestly don't know what these little bumps are. They're not P waves. One of them is a T wave. If I don't know what's happening here, it looks like flutter, but it's not because it's irregularly irregular. But yeah, this is your example of an ECG with AF, of AF. Here's our second SPA. So you've got Mr. Sapkowski. What do you want to do? Are you going to refer him to cardiology? Do you want to start a tenolol? Do you want to start for apamil? Do you want to start amiodarone and then titrate it down until you reach a maintenance dose, which is what you do with amiodarone if you want to use it long term? Or do you want to send him for a routine echo and request his BMP levels? What do people think? So, uh, E, not sure. Um, what makes you think it's E? I'm just intrigued because, like, it's quite good to understand why people are just like. Um, you're thinking about the alcohol and the, uh, so yes okay that's like a really important thing to consider actually yep. um that's good that, that's really good um that's not the most common thing so like it's the single best answer so the most common thing here uh isn't going to be a dilated cardiomyopathy but it's really good that you've thought of that the yeah. answer is actually c yeah then why is it not to the trap why is it not b oh yeah then none of them fell into the trap wonderful Okay, not B, because remember, he's an asthmatic, so you can't give beta blockers. And if you have to give beta blockers, you really, really want to monitor them because you've got a high risk of making their asthma worse. Okay, so giving them verapamil. Uh, AF, like I said, is the most, most common uh, arrh arrh arrhythmia as a whole, actually. And... You can classify it differently. So on the right, you've got your classification. You can, this is unlikely to, this is not really examination material. It might come up in an OSCE, highly unlikely. If they bring an SBA on it, that's just a waste of an SBA. But treatment kind of depends. You've got your first diagnosed AF. And then after that, if you've got your, you've got your paroxysmal AF, which doesn't last longer than seven days. Uh, persistent, which is longer than seven days, but it's terminated by drugs. Your long standing is lasting for over a year and you're using a rhythm strategy and permanent is if you if the clinician and the patient agree that we're not really going to do anything, uh, anything about it, either that or one which doesn't respond to treatment. There are loads and loads of things that can cause AF. The important thing is you want to rule out secondary causes. Almost anything happening in the chest can cause AF, and pneumonia, thyroid disease. If you've operated around that area, cardiac ischemia, heart failure, high blood pressure, valve diseases are important. Mitral stenosis is a known cause of AF and comes up in question prompts for, for uh, mitral stenosis. Things like patients got um, flushed cheeks and an irregularly irregular pulse. What's the most likely diagnosis? That points towards mitral stenosis. Um, you've got rarer causes, things like cardiomyopathies, pericarditis, sarcoid, as usual, causing everything. Some cancers can cause it. There's a long, long, long list. Um, you may, it's up to you what you want to divide it into. So the common causes and rare causes, you may want to divide it into cardiac and non-cardiac causes. As long as you have a system for when, for example, uh, a consultant, asks you what are the causes of AF rather than just jumping in with, for example, uh, the first things to come to mind like cardiomyopathy or pericarditis, you can structure it, but also useful when you are presented with a patient and you want to rule out what might be causing this patient's AF. If in this setting you're in a, you're in a GP setting and it's a fairly elderly patient and you can't detect signs, for example, like if you auscultate and you don't suspect it's pneumonia, there's no fever, you can't hear any murmurs, there's no there's no crackles or swollen legs, so you don't think it's heart failure, and there's no sign of anything else going on, then you can you're fairly safe to assume that it's a primary AF, which just happens in older people, for example, because of degeneration of the of the conduction fibers. Were, were you going to say something, Nush? 
Uh, I mean, I was going to ask if anyone knew what um, AF due to acute alcohol intake is called. There's a colloquial term. Oh, yes. Does anyone know? It has a little grey box in the handbook. Yeah, holiday, holiday heart syndrome. Yeah. So that, that happens in like young people. They just go yeah. on a binge and they're suddenly in AF and they can yeah. feel their heartbeat. And if they stop drinking for a few days, it'll go away. But they're yeah. more likely to get another episode if they do acutely drink a lot of alcohol. Yeah. Uh, that's the only interesting one, I think. Yeah. So find a system that you prefer for classifying your causes of AF and that's all you need for it. Just remember, a lot of things will cause AF. It is very, very non-specific. If you can treat the reversible cause, fantastic. If not, then we're looking at the management side of things. So this is a good algorithm for the treatment of AF. Remember, you've got your rate control and rhythm control. What would make you prefer rate control over rhythm control in a patient? Age. Good. What, yeah. what, what age are we thinking of? So someone said younger. What do you want to prefer in a younger person? Sixty-five and over. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's that is what Nice says. So rate control is recommended in patients over fifty-five. else what you want to consider whether they're stable or not yeah that, that that's like your primary consideration yeah yeah asthmatic or not yeah good yeah just to clarify, we're assuming, we're assuming this patient is stable. This isn't a patient who's come into uh, the emergency department with a blood pressure of 90 over 50. So this is the man you're seeing in GP who seems to be fine. They're just in AF. History of ischemic heart disease. Yeah, also important. Good. Yeah, definitely. Good. Do we... Do you want to get... Sorry. Do we tend to prefer rate or rhythm control and... Why do we generally prefer one over the other? We prefer rate control, yeah. Perfect. And why do why is rate control ideally first line? Less drug side effects. Perfect. That's what I was looking yeah. for. So if we talk yeah. about Every specialty has them. The drugs which are really quite effective but have horrific side effects. Rheumatology's got about, well, all of them. Uh, for cardiology, it's amiodarone. So, mind putting into the chat the side effects of amiodarone that you know about. Oh, this is a useful thing to know because yeah. it has a million. It has a lot. Hyper and hypothyroidism, yes. Perfect, yeah. It really messes with the thyroid. Yeah. Grey skin, yes. Yeah. What Slate else? skin syndrome. Those are the important ones, definitely. What, what are some less common side effects? Pulmonary and liver fibrosis, yeah. Yeah, that's right, good. If they're on long-term amiodarone, yeah. Yeah. Fatty liver disease, uh, it might well be. I didn't actually know that. Uh, prolonged QT. Yep. Yeah. It's associated with prolonged QT because it's a potassium channel blocker. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, those are all the important ones. Yeah. Fantastic. So, je the, so it's an annoying drug to monitor because you need to do baseline uh, re um, respiratory function tests, liver function tests, thyroid function tests. You need a chest x-ray to check for the fibrosis. You usually monitor, for example, uh, three and six months. 
So it's an annoying drug to be on. It's an effective drug in terms of what it's treating, but it's a really annoying drug to be on. It's a, with the likes of things like clozapine for schizophrenia or carbinazole for hypothyroidism. Good drug, needs monitoring, a lot of side effects. But yeah, so if we look at the algorithm, ideally we want rate control. That's with a beta blocker, a calcium channel blocker. Remember, never both, because they will go into bradycardia and they will pass out. Comes up in SBAs, it will be something like, they're already on a they're already on atenolol and their heart failure or their angina or their af isn't controlled one of the options is add on for apinil avoid like the plague they will fall over it's yeah do not give two agents which reduce the heart rate if it helps obviously you continue it if it's not or as you see in the box on the left as somebody mentioned if it's really if it's really symptomatic it's coming back cardiomyopathies, for example, then you're thinking of rhythm control. It's at that point worth going for rhythm control. Cardioversion is an option for persistent AF. Uh, and then you can go back to thinking about rate control. Um, but here at the bottom left, if nothing is really working, that's when you consider catheter ablation. And catheter ablation, essentially, you put the catheter in through the radial artery or the femoral artery, you go up through the you get to the pulmonary vein and what you want what they end up doing is cryoablation off around the pulmonary veins the idea is isolating those circuits those the electrical activity from the pulmonary vein to the sinoatrial node uh, usually they have to do it repeated times because if you do it once it's got a 20 to 30 percent chance of helping so usually multiple episodes multiple um operations or procedures are needed to do it but that's a last resort and if anybody's got any questions about the management of that please let us know uh, so like we said rate control is dangerous in patients who have got pre-existing sinus node disease or bradycardia and that's why you don't want to give two of them at the same time uh, you want to involve rhythm control meds uh, in patients also with SAN or AVN disease unless they've got a pacemaker ICD the reason for that is if you've already got AVN disease and you give somebody amiodarone they'll probably go into heart block they're likely to, for, then that can degenerate into a ventricular tachycardia, for example, or them to pass, them to faint. So you would ideally want a pacemaker. Um, digoxin, nowadays the only time you will often see digoxin if it's a patient with heart failure and atrial fibrillation, that's one of the only things it's licensed for nowadays. And like I said, catheter ablation is generally a last resort. So we've started Mr. Sapkowski on a calcium channel blocker. What else do we want to do for him? What else might we want to do for him? Yeah, anticoagulation. Perfect. Okay. Yep. So anticoagulation is the next big step. So you don't immediately put on an anticoagulation. Again, these are things to learn the night before your OSCE. You've got your Chadvask, you've got your uh, Hasbled. Your Chadvask is essentially what makes you decide if you anticoagulate them or not and your has bled is what makes you think ah oh, should i anticoagulate them is there a benefit risk ratio essentially the higher their has bled the greater the risk the lower the greater the benefit will be with chad vask a score of one in a man means anticoagulate a score of two or above in a woman means anticoagulate the reason why it's two is because women automatically get a point because they're at higher risk due to estrogen levels What's Mr. Sapkowski's Chadvask score? So he's 71 with diabetes. He's never had a stroke, doesn't have any valve disease, doesn't have heart failure, doesn't have high blood pressure. Yeah, yeah two. Perfect. Score of two, and what's his has bled? Let's say his his bloods his bloods come back normal. Yeah, three. Yeah, so he probably gets like. You could give them two because of high alcohol intake, and you, yeah. uh, you'd give them one for age. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah, 
So that's two. Oh. So he's fairly, so he's low he's low risk uh, for bleeding, and he is going to get anticoagulated because he's got a Chad Vask of two. What are our options for anticoagulating, um, Mr. Sapkowski? Um, sorry, what's D A P P? What's that? that? Uh, I'm just interested. Someone wrote D A P P, and I've not actually heard that. Okay. Ah, dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, so dual antiplatelet therapy doesn't work for in situ like rhombus formation. So um, it's a good idea, but it's better for like heart attacks or MI. It's not really for um, atrial fibrillation. Yeah, so warfarin, DOAX, um, exactly are your mainstay of treatment. Yeah, perfect. What else could you use if it was short term? Which it's not, but if it was, what would you use? Yeah, heparin, a, a low molecular weight heparin specifically. Ideally, yeah. Um, just a quick word about antiplatelets and anticoagulants. Remember, your antiplatelets are useful uh, if there is a thrombus to stop getting it stop it getting any bigger or any worse that's why for example we give them in acute coronary syndrome whereas your anticoagulants are useful if you're anticipating development of a thrombus to stop it from happening so that's why in vascular disease we want antiplatelets but we don't really bother with anticoagulants because they don't increase your risk uh, vascular disease doesn't in uh, increase your risk of suddenly developing embolus for example Whereas in AF, that's what you're worried about. You don't want it to form in the first place. If you've got vascular disease, you've likely got small clots and plaques lying around. You don't want them to get any bigger. Okay, so warfarin and DOAX, good. Um, this is a nice flow chart for that as well. So if we go through it, he uh, qualifies for anticoagulation. He's got the has blood score. You talk with him and he, he's happy to start on it. Um, he, what's that? Yeah, at the he's same not... time, shall we not go through the flow track? Actually? Yeah, okay, sure. And if anyone has any questions, they can ask us. Yeah. Um, just one important thing. So you start someone on warfarin. Um, what what do you also need to start them on in the first few days? Yeah, low molecular weight heparin. Does anyone know why? Yeah, exactly. Why? Bridging, for what reason? Warfarin takes time to act. Yes, it does. Yeah, and one point. It increases clotting risk initially, exactly. It yeah, increases the it. INR initially. Do you know why? Yeah. Why does it increase your risk of clotting initially? Does anyone know what warfarin's knocking out initially yeah yeah so it's protein cns that's yeah. exactly so protein cns usually protect against thrombosis they have yeah. far shorter half-lives than any of the vitamin k dependent factors so you, you those will deplete first and you become pro-thrombotic initially yeah Okay, so remember, DOAX and NOAX are the same, different names for the same things. Different doctors use different names. These are drugs like Ruvaroxaban, Apixaban, Dabigatran. Um, remember, those first two are, oh, whoops. Uh, those, oh God, those first two are factor 10A inhibitors, whereas um, Dabigatran is a direct thrombin inhibitor. You've got some benefits, reasons why you'd prefer them over warfarin. Biggest one is they interact with a lot less drugs. Warfarin interacts with everything because remember, it's metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system. So any inducers or inhibitors will affect warfarin. It's problematic, for example, when you start somebody on antibiotics, things like uh, they, yeah, they interact with a hell of a lot of things. These also have faster onset and because they've got a very predictable drug profile, unlike warfarin, you don't actually need to monitor them anywhere near as much. Often you don't need to monitor them at all, but you don't need to monitor them anywhere as near as much as warfarin, 
Problem is, if somebody comes in with acute with an acute bleed, there's no reversal agent like with warfarin, where you've got your prothrombin com complex, for example. There is a monoclonal antibody for dabigatran, uh, idarucizumab, um, but that's you know not always readily available. What people tend to rely on is supportive care because the half lives aren't too long, um, so usually they flush themselves out of the system. DOACs are also quite expensive, and actually there's no evidence of increased compliance over warfarin, which is the whole point of them. Drugs which are less annoying than warfarin, so maybe people would take them more often, because warfarin has some, a lot of time got a very poor compliance. So um, that's usually the balance. Younger patients tend to get DOACs. Uh, usually patients you see on warfarin are older patients who've been on it for a while. Newly prescribed patients ideally go on DOACs, but there are cost considerations and so on. Not going to do this as an OSCE station, but it has come up as an OSCE station before. Warfarin counselling, where someone has just been starting on warfarin and you want to, you need to talk them through it. Things that you'll want to remember for that, you can read this slide in your own time because it's quite information heavy. But obviously, why they're on warfarin, the monitoring, and the biggest things are, are things like the slightly obvious ones, the no, sorry, not so obvious ones like lifestyle changes, avoid contact sports avoid alcohol because that affects your clotting and avoid green vegetables because they've got loads of vitamin K. So there are dietary changes as well. But anyway, you can read through that in your own time. If anybody's got any questions about that, ask us. Why does it cause jaundice? Oh no, are you still there? Oh yeah, I'm here. Oh, sorry. I thought I thought you'd I thought you'd ask the I thought you'd ask them. Uh, why does it cause jaundice? Um, it can interfere with it can interfere with the liver, so it can cause a um, what's it called? It can cause a bit of an obstructive profile, so it can cause um, aberrant liver function tests. It interferes with uh, the conjugation of bilirubin. Uh, miscellaneous stuff, Wolf Parkinson, what, these are the kind of things that they will come up in SBAs rather than OSCEs, so it's buzzwords, Wolf Parkinson White, you've got an um, aberrant uh, electrical conduction pathway called the Bundle of Kent, which connects the atrium ventricles, bypassing the AVN node, um, and you get a feedback loop. That, you ablate the Bundle of Kent. Heart blocks, remember you've got your three types, one, two, and three, three being complete heart block. Basically, if they're symptomatic, which they almost always are, apart from type 1 heart block, which a lot of times are asymptomatic, they need a pacemaker. Bradyarrhythmias, they need a pacemaker. You don't want to give them rate control because you'll make it worse. Sick sinus syndrome, a lot of causes, a lot of them are just because somebody's old and their sinus, uh, sinoatrial node is becoming fibrosed or breaking down. What you need to know about these patients, they have a tendency to switch between tachycardia and bradycardia. So the problem is if you give them a agent to slow down their heart, they'll go into bradycardia. If you give them something like atropine to speed up their bradycardia, they'll go into tachycardia. So usually they need, a, almost always they need a pacemaker because it's very, very difficult to control pharmacologically. But yeah, these are miscellaneous arrhythmias which come up in SBAs. Uh, and you should put in the this is, slide. Yeah, this is, this is like a dumb mnemonic that like Vaughan Williams used to teach his class in Oxford. Um, double quarter, quarter pounder, left, lettuce, mayo, tomato, fries, please. Um, this won't come up in your exams, but some ancient consultants love asking about it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like, pr probably no asking. I mean, we could have, we probably could have said that a few weeks ago, but like, I would recommend like still do your clinical communication stuff just in case. Yeah. For now, until we know for 100% that there's no OSCE. Exactly, yeah. Uh, station three, we've got Mr. Ovon Everick, who's a 37 year old man. He's been brought in by his work colleagues. So he works uh, the night shift at um, a factory nearby. He's complaining that he's feeling really, really dizzy and faint, and he has palpitations. You're sitting down trying to get a history with him, and he just collapses. You're the F1. This is your first night take uh, on the weekend of the Royal Free. What are you going to do? Happens. Yes, Dr. ABCD. 
Yay. Oh, love it. Love it. Not lovely. Yep, you're doing your doctor ABCD just like last week. So you do that. Uh, no danger. He's not responding to voice and pain. Uh, airway's clear and there's no obstruction, but his SATs are just 82% on air. There's normal percussion. There's no cyanosis or chest expansion. His trachea is central. There's no abnormal breath sounds because he's not breathing. Uh, he's got pale, cold peripheries with a non-palpable central or peripheral pulse. His cap refills three seconds and his blood pressure is 84 over 50. His GCS is three, which means his GCS is the exact same as the device you are watching this on. And his pupils are pearl, uh, yeah, equal and reactive to light. His blood glucose is normal. Nothing on exposure. Uh, yeah, what, what, what do you want to do now? Uh, Ahmed, can you have a look at the chat? I just need to get the door off. Yeah, there was one problem. The chat isn't up to date for me. Uh, God damn it. It's so far back that it's still on option two whenever everybody was answering two. I'm going to assume, I'm really sorry because I can't see the chat because my one's just being stupid, but I'm going to assume that uh, you guys have got it right because you're all clever people. Um, yeah. You're gonna you're gonna scream uh, for help. You're gonna get somebody to put out a crash call. You're two 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 uh, adult cardiac arrest in the emergency department. They're gonna send the crash team with the anaesthetists. The med reg is gonna come over. They're gonna need an anaesthetist because his GCS is three. He needs to be intubated. Uh, and in the meantime, somebody's brought the crash trolley over. Realistically, I don't like this. Is obviously the ideal medical school approach, but in real life when you are doing airway and you'd notice he's not breathing and then you'd feel and he's not got a pulse you're going to scream for help and you're going to start cpr really like you're not gonna you're not going to be percussing and auscultating and so on once you've noticed he's not breathing and there's no pulse you've started cpr okay so you have is that going to switch that yeah so you've called for help Nurses put up the crash call, you started CPR, the anaesthetist and medreg are on the way, they've brought the crash trolley with the defib on it, you stick the pads on, and this is what you see. So first of all, what's that showing? What's that, Trace? I've returned. Yeah, Ventricular tachycardia. Fab. Tangent, because we love tangents. What else? Wait, one second. Trace? Um. So someone said VF. So a VF, you wouldn't get like this regular pattern. It would just yeah. be a complete mess. It would be, yeah. Like, it, it, there is no discernible pattern in VF at all. It's completely erratic. Yeah. I just remember that. All right, continue. So any takers for what else could cause this trace? Uh, other causes just to speed th okay just to speed things up technically somebody with an svt and a bundle branch block could get a trace like that however if you see this trace you don't care about that you are treating it as vt because that's what's going to kill somebody what's this patient going to need what is yeah what what do you want done as quickly as possible Shock, yes. Wonderful. You want DC cardioversion. If you're going to take anything from today for real life and for SBAs or whatever, if a patient is hemodynamically unstable with any arrhythmia, they need to be shocked as soon as possible. If they've collapsed, if their blood pressures, uh, blood pressures off any sign of sho shock or hemodynamic instability, they need cardioversion. Doesn't matter what the arrhythmia is, if it's AF, if it's an SVT, if it's VF, if it's VT, they need shocking. This is the acute arrhythmia algorithm. This covers uh, this covers everything that you need for ED from your narrow QRS, your SVTs, your AFs, all the way to your ventricular tachycardias, which are your quite scary ones. Know your ALS algorithm as well. So things like when to give adrenaline, how much, when to give amiodarone. Uh, and won't go through them now for time, but your four H's and your four T's, um, remem remember those. Can you be, be tested on ALS? 
Absolutely. Yeah. It can come up as an OSCE station. Maybe not on SBAs, or unless they ask a question about doses. SBA stuff will be doses, or when would you give the first bolus of adrenaline after which CPR cycle, for example. But yeah, you can be tested on ALS. Okay, what's it going to give me next? This is your bradyarrhythmia algorithm. If they're coming in with some set, with instability, atropine's the mainstay. Um, but what they usually need is transvenous pacing. So through the vein, electrical, essentially a wire through the vein that paces the heart. Very quickly, long QT, easy SBA material, also OSCE material. There are congenital causes, not really going to come up. What you want to know is the electrolyte disturbances, which cause it, things like hypokalemia. And you want to know the drugs. There are a lot of drugs. Generally, antipsychotics, almost all of them will cause it. Quite a few antibiotics, so Cipro, your macrolides will cause it. Um, yeah, and remember anything which is a P450 uh, inhibitor, which will cause buildup of a drug which causes long QT, increases long QT. If it's untreated, it'll go to uh, uh, point, and that can and will kill people. So you're going to give them, you're going to give them magnesium sulfate. Anyone know why we give magnesium sulfate? I don't know the answer to this. Then you will have some fun with this. What's the point of magnesium? Oh, yeah. In terms of electrophysiology, what's what's magnesium's job? Oh, wait, I do know the answer to this. Never mind. Something to do with K2+. plus. Yeah. Ah. So two things, actually. So it, yep, yeah, so main or big bit is it slows down potassium efflux so it extends the repolarization of the cell of the cardiomyocytes which st which uh, basically to bring, bring it down to the mechanism is with long qt syndrome you've got an elongated qt interval the cell is repolarizing for longer because the cell is trying to is in this state of repolarization for longer, you've got a greater chance of things called um, early after depolarizations, which essentially, because it's the heart's so used to its cycle, it depolarizes in the middle of repolarization. If it does that, then that can spread to other myocytes. You get depolarization that spreads to other myocytes. You get a very weird rhythm which spreads out through the heart, and it's, yeah. Uh, you will lose atrial control and the ventricles start doing their own thing with a ventricular tachycardia, a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Um, so the whole point of magnesium is magnesium is actually really important for calcium channels. It potentiates calcium channels and it also stops uh, it stops uh, potassium channels. So, yeah. Essentially, you're stopping uh, early. De you're stopping early after depolarizations because remember, you need calcium for depolarization. You need it. You stop that. And if you stop, if you uh, slow down potassium efflux, you stop the chance of early depolarizations as well coming from the sinoatrial node, for example. So yeah, magnesium, magnesium sulfate. Um, what quickly. other unrelated condition is magnesium sulfate really good for? Because magnesium is just some godlike chemical that just picks. Yeah. Asthma, yes. Okay, cool. Wonderful. And fifth year eclampsia. Hypocalcemia, not so much. I think you can use it. But, you can uh, you, you can in terms of releasing calcium, but generally hypocalcemia you want to give them cal you want to give them calcium. Hypomagnesemia can cause hypocalcemia because the two are intricately linked. Remember your periodic table, uh, they're in the same group. So the channels, uh, the calcium channels will take um, magnesium as well because it's it's a very similar shape, same number. Of, Not uh, sure about epilepsy, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, haven't heard of it in epilepsy though. Okay, sure. Oh, what have I done? Uh, we're going to end some spot ECGs because they're fun. Uh, we've got this. End of the first case. Yeah, so end of, hang on, have I, have I skipped too far? I feel like I have. Yeah, I have. Why is it going forward and not backwards? Press left. I'm pressing left. Okay, yeah. Can you do it? Yeah, just. Yeah. Okay, good. 
OK. First one, what's this? Delta waves. Yeah, nice. What did delta waves go? Yes, Wolf Parkinson White. Cool. Wonderful. Next. So this is Wolf Parkinson White. You've got your delta waves. Uh, next. I stop us and we'll go back and show you what we're talking about if you if you if you if you're confused. Does someone want me to go back? No, as in I'll let you know if they okay. want to go back. What is this Anyone one? Know? It is niche as hell, and you will probably never see it in your life unless you go into cardiology. I can you and even show then, us the delta waves. So if you see the massive QRSs in lead two, there is a slight like thing in the upstroke of the QRS. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like a staggered QRS rise. It's super subtle. Yeah. Just keep out, uh, keep a lookout for it. If you see it, yeah, it's um, it's going to be Wolf Parkinson White. Do you see that, Nizifa? Is that okay? Yeah. So instead of going straight up, it's got a little, yeah, slope to it. Okay. Uh, did anyone know what this was? It can cause sudden death. COVID complex. Men. I love that. <laughs> it can cause sudden death in men, usually in their 40s from Southeast Asia. It is known as the night killer. Uh, Hockham? Mm -hmm. No, what not, else? Well, not, I, I don't think you'll know this. It's super rare. Yeah. So I know you said it because he said sudden death. <laughs> yeah. So um, basically, your ST, your ST segments here, they look like tombstones, which is what you're supposed to be looking out for. This is Brigada syndrome. It is a rare channelopathy common in men from Thailand mostly, but also from other parts of Southeast Asia, which can cause and will cause sudden death in their 40s. These men need uh, implantable uh, cardiac defibrillators. Um, so, Hockham, oh. you'll get, if we just go back, yeah. these QRS complexes will be massive, like they'll overlap. Yeah. Oh, God, so. sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah. Go, next one. This one, what's wrong here? What do you peeps think? Anyone have any ideas? No T waves in three? Hmm. Fair point, fair point. Fair point. <laughs> but I, that's not the hint. Anyone else? Yeah, MCQ, please. Inverted P waves. Normal ECG. Yes, it's a normal ECG. Thank you. This is a normal the ECG. Hardest, the hardest thing to tell is the normal exactly. ECG or a yeah. normal test X-ray. Yeah, this cool. is a normal ECG. This one. That we might have talked about earlier. Yes, potentially. This is... Uh, is it water? Um, Torsa de Poix, normal yeah. ECG. This is, t yeah, this is TDP. This is, this is Torsa de Poix. So you've got your ticker tape pattern. Uh, personally, I can never, I can never see the twisting of the points that they talk about. Um, but I think this is, I don't think this is a great example of TDP, to be fair. I, don't I will send one in the group when I find one. I have a good example. Okay, and this is the last one, I think. Uh, 
Any ideas? Prolonged QT. Wonderful. Prolonged QT. Yeah. Remember, your QT yeah. goes from the start of the Q wave to the end of the T wave. It shouldn't be more than 420 milliseconds. This one is around 500. And uh, actually, oh, yeah, last one. What's this? What is the most obvious abnormality? Anyone? Very short PR. Are there? Well, yeah, no. I mean, PR yeah, I mean, under yeah, 200 yeah. is fine. Or is that a notched P wave or ectopic beats? So it's not ectopic beats because you would mm. see ventricular complexes. Um, is this heart block? Yeah, third what degree? type of heart block? Third degree, perfect. Rem <laughs> the ventricles have their own rhythm, and then you've got your P waves, which are just doing their thing. Here's a P wave, there's a P wave, which is stuck inside a QRS complex. There's another P wave. There's a P wave. There's a P wave. They're doing their each the two chain the atrium and ventricles are just doing their own thing. This is um, an annoying one to find, but oh, just put, if you put arrows above your ventricles and arrows below your uh, the P wave, sorry, and arrows above the QRX, you can see that each has their own rhythm. So do that in the SBA when they give you the uh, handout. Sorry, Anush, you can say something. Yeah. Uh, so this, I mean, it could be two to one heart block, but uh, I'm not sure it is. It's kind of hard to tell the difference between like regular QRSs and irregular QRSs. I think if you plot it out, there is actually a slight discrepancy. So I don't think it is in this case. Okay. It just coincidentally, right, Oops. fine. Um, I need, so there, uh, we'll do some neuro. It'll be a quick case, like the end of the last one, because I just, like getting through lots of running stuff. This is a 72 year old man. Oh, do, if anyone has any questions about cardio, just drop them in and we'll answer them as we go along as well. Uh, he has this finding on the right hand side, even though this is clearly his left foot. Can everyone see the video playing? I can see it. I also. Yeah. Okay, cool. So. This is clonus, as the video is telling you. What kind of lesion is clonus associated with, generally? Upper motor neuron. Okay, so you go and examine this patient, right? What are the other findings you will find if he has an upper motor neuron lesion? Spasticity, spastic paralysis, hypotonia, Hyperreflexia, the Babinski reflex, which is known as up, which is the name for upgoing planters. Yep, you, I think you've got all of them. Bonus, hypotonia, brisk, increased reflexes, spastic weakness, upgoing planters. What type of hypotonia are you going to be getting with an upper motor neuron lesion? So a spastic is a type of paralysis, not a type of tone. But uh, a spastic just means there's increased tone, pretty much. Uh, yeah, so there's two types. There's velocity-dependent and velocity-independent tone. Um, in this case, you would get velocity-dependent tone. So what this means is when you're examining them, you're going to move their arm. You can move it slowly, and you can move it quickly. When you move it qu slowly, you'll notice that there's increased tone. But if you move it quickly, it'll give away like it's completely normal tone. Um, and yeah, so these are the, Michael's just talked about which muscles it tends to prefer if it's like a stroke, so flexors in, in the upper limb or extensors in the lower limb tend to go first and tend to be stronger. So upper limb will look a bit like this, lower limb will be extended and straight. Um, so velocity independent tone is caused by what specifically? What set of conditions? 
Yeah, so Parkinsonism, exactly. Um, and th this is also known as lead, lead pipe rigidity. So regardless of what speed you move the arm at, it's going to be really rigid. Um, a good way of remembering this is any, any increased turn that's due to like the pyramidal tract will be velocity dependent. Anything that's outside of them will be um, non-velocity dependent. Okay, we'll come back to Parkinsonism later. Uh, so causes of motor neuron lesions this is the way I like to split up. You have problems in the brain and problems in the cord. There are some other weird and wonderful things that don't respect these boundaries. Does anyone know what two conditions are, like you need to know about that don't respect these boundaries? Multiple sclerosis, yes. Which part of the nervous system does multiple sclerosis affect only? Yeah, central nervous system only, not the peripheral nervous system, but yeah, it can be both the brain or the core. Uh, and what other disease that doesn't tend to affect the central nervous system causes upper motor neuron signs? Motor neuron disease, precisely. Um, okay, and, and grain barre can also cause it. Actually, I just forgot to write it down. Um, and what like kind of what tends to precede Guillain Barre? Yeah, it's more commonly lower motor neuron though. I think it, I think there is a subtype that can cause upper motor neuron, but classically it's lower motor neuron. Yeah, so it, it's usually preceded by a like infection of some type. So you can get an upper respiratory tract infection, but more commonly Campylobacter. Yeah. Gastroenteritis. Um what kind of food are you going to be catching Campylobacter from? Sorry, I just love going off on tangents. We might as well make this useful. Exactly. Yeah, meat, poultry, yeah, and eggs, that kind of thing. Yeah, raw chicken. Yeah, good. Um, so we're going to talk about motor neuron disease next. And before I show you all the answers about it, what are your classical, like, what was your classical presentation of motor neuron disease? What signs are you going to find on examination? So you get mixed upper neuron and lower motor neuron signs. Uh, and there's one thing in an SPA, if you see, you're going to want to think of motor neuron disease, one specific wow. finding. So there's that and there's one other thing. Anyone know? So yeah, tongue, what in the tongue specifically? Tongue fasciculation, yeah. So fasciculation is generally, you want to be thinking of motor neuron disease. Um, and motor neuron disease, yeah, you get upper and lower motor neuron uh, signs. You can get fasciculations, but remember that the most common cause of fasciculations are benign fasciculations. So if you notice some, don't get scared. Tongue fasciculations, I think, are specifically, are, are, they're quite specific for MND. Do you know how you would test for them? Like, or rather what you wouldn't do when you're testing for a tongue fasciculation. This is like, uh, neurologists love this. Mm. How would you test some tongue fasciculation? Bainan loves it too. Don't ask them to stick it out, exactly. So if you stick it out, there might be the muscle, uh, muscles of the tongue move a lot. So you might see some fasciculations anyway. So get them to just hold it in their mouth and just say, ah. If they're fasciculating, then you want to think of motor neuron disease. And the pathology is like this anterior cell destruction within the spinal cord. You, you always rule out other stuff. You might want to consider an EMG because awful prognosis. You can give them Rilazole, which prolongs like the need for ventilation by a few months, but it's, it's, it's awful. And it's one of the causes of, like, it's one of the non-cancerous causes of palliative care that you need to know about next year. Uh, it's awful disease. Fine. So guess what the next slide is going to be? Does no one want to play the game? Fine. Start to blow a moat in your own lesions. <laughs> yes, oh, Vikram plays the game. Fine. What are the main signs you will associate with lower motor neuron lesions? Hypotonia which doesn't split up into 
weird things. Hyperreflexia, muscle wasting. And what kind of paralysis would you describe it as? Flaccid paralysis, exactly. Those are like the four buzzwords for lower motor neuron signs. And how would you like to split up the causes of lower motor neuron lesions? Excluding the weird and wonderful motor neuron disease. Well, there are two big categories of causes. So yes, peripheral neuropathy is the first one. Yeah, you can do it by surgical sieve as well, definitely, but um, it's a bit complicated. I like to split it up into peripheral neuropathies and problems with nerves leaving the cord. Um, so peripheral neuropathies, we can talk about later if anyone wants to at the end, not the aim of this lecture, but you have all the medical causes that are super interesting. And then you have the boring like trauma that you get in orthopedics that I will not talk about. And then all the problems with nerves leaving the cord, common causes are like really bad disc prolapse, cancer, trauma, and then osteoporosis and TB. They cause, you get like vertebral fractures, but like they don't often cause nerve problems and neuropathies. They cause things like sciatica, but like actual neuropathies are a bit more rare and obviously motor neuron disease. Right, we're going to go back to stroke. So here is a lovely reference slide for you all on what each of the lobes in the brain do. I'm not going to read it out for you because it's boring to read things out. Useful things to remember, speech is always in the dominant hemisphere. So I am a right-handed person. Where is Where are my speech areas going to be? Left, exactly. And therefore, the visuospatial processing in my brain goes on in the right. Um, and this is the blood supply of the brain. What, 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 causes, what supplies the brain that you all learned to death in the second year? Uh, the circle of Willis, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, it's quite useful to know, to be honest. I'm not going to go through it, but you should probably learn it. Yeah, like, just have an idea of anatomy. I have an idea of it, especially yeah, it's definitely. useful for the posterior, like cerebellar infarcts, things like Wallenberg syndrome. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're not going to talk about weird cerebellar strokes today. We can do it another time if you want. Let me know um, because they're a bit more complicated. But the important things for your exams are the cerebral strokes. So, what are the three arteries that supply the cerebral cortex? You can use the acronyms. ACA, yeah, anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries. So we'll start at the front and we'll work backwards. What signs will you get with an anterior cerebral artery in far? This is shown by the blue area on this diagram. Worth mentioning, these are SBA land questions because in real life, everything's on the table. Yeah. They love stroke SBAs, by the way. We had so many. Yeah. My God, we do. Leg weakness, yes. Mm -hmm. Specifically leg weakness, and why is that? Yeah, so contralateral weakness of the leg more than the arm and rarely the face. And that's because of what, James? Mike, we'll get back to your questions. Because of the homunculus. Um, I don't have a picture of the homunculus, but if that confuses you, go and have a look at the homunculus and compare it to this blood supply diagram, and it'll make sense. Yeah, exactly. So the leg is in this medial bit of the cerebral cortex. The face is in this lateral bit that comes under a different uh, blood supply. Do left-handed people have opposite-sided dominant hemispheres? They often do, yeah. Yeah, um, it's... I don't think... Sorry, continue. Uh, no, 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 you go first. You finish. I, I, I don't think it's like an absolute definite thing, but I think they it's are more not, likely to... Yeah. So it's about a 60-40 split with left-hander. So I'm left-handed. Yeah. There's about a 60% chance that my dominant hemisphere is my is my right one. But it's never it's never an absolute. It's the same. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, uh, absolutely. Fine. So you're gonna have contralateral hemiparesis that favors the leg, and the face is almost always spared with an ACA infarct. But that's pretty academic, and in real life, it's all a bit up in the air. MCA signs? Is 
So yeah, more upper limb and facial weakness. Yeah, speech and sensory loss. Right. So you you lose the primary motor area again. You lose you lose the lateral part of the primary motor area, which is why you get the weakness. You're losing the the sensation because of the sensory cortex, and you also lose. You either lose speech or visuospatial uh, processing, depending on which hemisphere is affected. And the really important one that James talked about is homonymous hemianopia. So why do you get a homonymous hemianopia in an MCA infer? Uh, I, like, this takes you back to neuroanatomy, which I apologize for, but it's important. I don't. It's great. Yeah, so you have you have the two you have like the two pathways, the two optic radiations. One of them goes through the temporal lobe, and one of them goes through the parietal lobe. Uh, the previous slide has like a description of what causes what, but you tend to lose both in this case, so you get an homonymous hemianopia. Fine, and PCA infarct, you, all you get is a homonymous hemianopia because all all the posterior, uh, all the occipital lobe really does is vision. And but this time you get macular sparing, which is why do you get again, macular sparing, guys? Yeah, why do you get macular sparing? Yeah, you're so th there's like it, it's not compensation by the MCA, as far as I know. I thought it was to do with the other side, the PCA on the other side. There's a bit of the macula that's supplied by both sides. The MCA also is involved. Um, it? Yeah, so the part of the visual cortex which processes the macula has uh, supply from a branch of the MCA. Cool. I learned something new today. Um, fine. So those are like the main cerebral strokes that you need to know. And should, should we excuse like the pun? But what are like the two important speech areas that you need to know about? Brokers and Wernicke's, exactly. Uh, James, tell me about Broca's area. I love picking on people. More involved with the mechanics of speech, indeed. Um, and where is it found, roughly? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's like frontotemporal, frontal. Yeah, it's inferior, more interior than Inferior area. frontal gyrus, usually. Yeah, um, and they get, like, this expressive aphasia, so, like, I, the dumb way I rem remember it is like b -b 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 brokers because they can't actually do the motor bit of speech. Um, and who should I pick on? Uh, Como, do you want to tell me about Wernicke's area? Superior temporal gyrus, yes. Yep. What does it do? Yeah, so they have fluent speech that makes no sense. Fluent garbage is the way I like to think about it. And it, it's it's more with language and processing that rather than the motor aspect. Um, if you want to see really good examples of these, House, just Google uh, on YouTube. Look for the episodes of House that have examples of these. They're really good. Um, right, back to back to our patient. He's, the, a TLDR in terms of what signs he had. Pick your artery and pick your lobes. in whatever order you want to pick them in. So yeah, this is an MCA infarct affecting which lobes? So specifically, it is the right MCA, yeah. Which lobes are going? Yeah, 
right MCA? So we've lost the parietal lobe, which is why you've got reduced sensation. No, 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 that's fine. Absolutely. Yeah, parietal lobe is causing the loss of sensation and the loss of visual fields. Uh, temporal lobe, yes, because they, they're a bit dazed and like that kind of stuff is involved there. Um, uh, there's a bit of the frontal lobe as well, which is why they've got the upper motor neuron signs. Because that's because remember that like the the primary motor area is actually the frontal lobe. It's just a bit of it supplied by the MCA. Does that make sense? I've all of the answers to all of these are in the notes, the, the slides, by the way. If anyone wants to refer back, any questions? And then I um, I don't really want to read off the slide, but important thing is how you manage stroke. So within one hour, they need head and uh, like brain imaging because you want to rule out it being a hemorrhagic stroke, because if it is hemorrhagic, you can't do thrombo uh, thrombolysis with autoplays, which is a, an example of TPA. Does anyone know what TPA stands for? It's its mechanism of action. Good. Yeah, tissue plus minogen activator, exactly perfect. So just remember, below 4.5 hours, you're going to do both thrombolysis with thrombectomy. 4.5 to 6 hours, you can do a thrombectomy. But if, if the CT shows salvageable tissue between 6 and 24 hours, uh, you can still do a thrombectomy. You need to know the autoplase dose. I can't remember. No, I don't think so, no. to be honest. Definitely it's not. a bit rogue. It's yeah. like a consultant level decision to thrombolize anyway. Yeah, also it's weight dependent, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. Uh, you don't. Um, and then if, if they don't fall into any of these categories, you need to give them aspirin for two weeks and then give them 75 milligrams of clopidogrel after that. Don't forget to treat the underlying cause. Why have I put that in capitals? What is the most common underlying cause of stroke in the UK? Yeah, atrial fibrillation, which is how this ties into the first part of this lecture. So remember to anticoagulate. That is the biggest risk factor for having a stroke. Fine. Um, I'm from, and there's primary and secondary prevention stuff that you can look through in your own time that I'm not going to talk about. Fine. Back to Parkinsonism that James mentioned. Um, what is the triad of Parkinsonism? Three things. Bradykinesia, tremor and rigidity. Perfect. Yeah, there you go. And I'm going to, so on examination of a patient with Parkinson's, you might describe something known as cogwheeling. What is cogwheeling? So cogwheeling is when you have the tremor superimposed on top of the rigidity. That's all cogwheeling is. So you've got this, you've got like hypotonia, but as you move, move their hand, it moves in, in like a stepwise fashion because of the tremor that they also have. That's like a, a question that neuroconsultants love to throw at you. And what are the causes of Parkinsonism? You're, you're allowed to say the obvious one. You're also allowed to say everything. Yeah. So, okay, so degeneration, so the classical cause of degenerative uh, Parkinsonism is Parkinson's disease. Um, drugs can cause it. We'll talk about mm -hmm. which ones in a minute. Metabolic problems like Wilson's disease can cause it. Yeah. And you can have vascular problems. Um, okay. The, okay. The degenerative causes, you have both Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's plus syndromes. Uh, family history is, is, I think it increases your risk of having Parkinson's disease. Yeah. It's like, I wouldn't say it's a cause, but it, it means you have a higher risk of Parkinson's. There are some genetic forms. Those are the early onset ones, but those are quite yeah. rare. Yeah. Um, what, give me an example. So what kind of drugs classically cause Parkinsonism? I know that these technically don't come under fourth year anymore, but like you should still know them from a neuro perspective. Yeah, eight antipsychotics and specifically first generation are more likely to cause. Mm. 
Parkinsonism. Um, metoclopramide, I think, also can actually. Yeah. It's because more it's common with dystonias. Yeah. Yeah. It more commonly causes I, acute dystonia, but it can. Don't give someone with Parkinson's metoclopramide. Yeah. Try to avoid it. And not even try. Just don't do it. Uh, okay. Haloperidol is an antipsychotic, so yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Lithium. Not think, typically known to. I don't think so, yeah. Um, and someone already mentioned the important metabolic disorder that you need to remember, which is Wilson's disease, um, where you have... What blood test finding would you have on with Wilson's disease? What, what's your test? Some mod B revision. So, I mean, yeah, you have more copper, but there, what what test are you doing? Yes, yeah, ceruloplasmin. Yeah, so you've got low ceruloplasmin is like your giveaway for Wilson's disease. Mm -hmm. And the reason they get Parkinson's is because they get copper deposition within the substantia nigra. And vascular events, if you get a if you've got substantia nigra involvement in a stroke, so in some mm -hmm. specific stroke syndromes, you can get like a vascular Parkinson's disease. Uh, Parkinson's disease, degeneration of dopaminergic neurons caused by Lewy bodies it, and its alpha synuclein. And need to know about the triad of Parkinsonism. Other important features on examination are these hypomimia. What does that mean? Anyone know? Hypomimia. Uh, they can also get speaking problems, but that's not what this means. But that's a good one that I forgot to add on. Reduced facial expression, yeah. Mimia, mimic, that kind of thing. Micrographia, their handwriting gets smaller and smaller, and a shuffling gait. Um, so there is a differential diagnosis for shuffling gait that we won't talk about today, but. A lot of people with non-neurological conditions can present with a shuffling gait. So just keep that in mind as well. Um, fine. And then, if my slides work, which would be nice. Are they not working? Okay. So Parkinson's disease, you will get, will, will classically present with their symptoms. But if you trace these people back, they have these really early features and early symptoms that don't seem like they're related to Parkinson's disease, but they predict the disease happening. Do you know, there's three of, three really important ones that you might need to know about. Do you know what they are? Anosmia is the most commonly known one. Constipation mm -hmm. is also mm -hmm. quite common. And the most, the most niche one is this REM sleep behavioral disturbance where they start acting out their dreams. Um, there is another one. one. Oh, what's the other one? There is another one which affects 30, 34% of patients, so a third of patients, if you trace them back. Loss of taste in Earl Grey tea. I love that. That's amazing. unfortunate. So um, if you trace them back, 34% of Yeah, depression, exactly. Yeah. So often the first that. presenting symptom is depression. <laughs> um, sorry, I needed to love React. How early on would this occur? You can trace it back to, so if someone develops Parkinson's when they're like 70, you can trace it back as far as like 30s sometimes. So like it's really early. You can't diagnose Parkinson's based on this though. Like yeah. they're not specific at all. It's purely academic. Um, fine. And if we were to talk about the management of Parkinson's disease, so we'll talk about pharmacological management. Of course, you'd use like an MDT of, uh, approach. And do these symptoms precede Parkinson's plus two? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Can I do. think they can. They can. Yeah, yeah, they can do. Yeah. How would you split up the drugs we use to treat Parkinson's disease? There are two main categories of drugs. This is like the most logical pharmacology in all of medicine, I think. Maybe apart from the endo ones. <laughs> or, ex or endo, just replace. Um, it is gone. So, yeah. It, yeah. So, group one is drugs you can use to replace the lost dopamine. 
And group two is the drugs that you can use to prevent dopamine breakdown and to perpetuate their action in the synapses. Um, and then all, and some examples of drugs to replace lost dopamine, someone said it earlier. So you have dopamine precursors or dopamine agonists. Um, L-dopa is a precursor, but bromocryptine and rupinerol are agonists. What is an important side effect of a dopamine agonist more than L-dopa? But both anyway. Uh, so this kinesia is are common with all of them, but yeah, they are a bit more in agonist. But yeah, risk-taking behavior. Yeah, like people um, go off the rails when yeah, they start. It is bad. Um, dopamine it is really bad. I saw yeah, a case last like year lost where their pensions. Yeah, I saw. I saw. There's this guy on the woods last year who's recently been diagnosed. He used to be like a radio personality. I can't remember his name. Um, and within a week of starting his dopamine agonist he'd um gambled away most of his savings slept with like 10 prostitutes and contracted a uh, like three stis so like it's a really important side effect that you definitely do not want to forget about yeah um fine uh and then don't forget with l-dopa you give carbidopa to prevent the peripheral conversion of it into um in the periphery it will be converted to like adrenaline and noradrenaline. Um, but yeah, give carbidopa, which is a dopa, uh, decarboxylase inhibitor. Uh, drugs to stop. Also, someone said nausea and vomiting, BS mode engaged. Mm. Yes, that's always an answer, always given an Um Drugs to stop dopamine breakdown. There's two groups of drugs. One you use earlier on, one you use like a bit later on. Yeah, MAO inhibitors you use earlier, and then COMT inhibitors you use later. Perfect. And then if we talk briefly about Parkinson's plus syndromes, there are three that you need to know about. There's the next slide has it all on them. I'm quizzing you because it's quite, I mean, being quizzed is a good way to remember things. Does anyone know? So supranuclear palsy, let's start with that. Fine. What, what is the classical finding you get with supranuclear palsy? Which of these drugs is first line? Um, so first line is L-dopa plus carbidopa. Yeah, so you get like this upward, reduced upward gauge palsy. It's, I, actually, I don't think it's always reduced. I think it can also be increased. So it, like it depends on the patient. Um, so that's uh, PSP. Uh, what's multi-system atrophy? Yeah, you get early autonomic dysfunction. So if people have, if, if someone gets Parkinson's and they start falling a lot, you always want to think of PSP and MSA because they, why do they fall a lot with autonomic dysfunction? What causes them to fall? By the way, falling is like the most important thing in geriatric care. Yeah, yeah. so postural hypertension causes them to fall in multi-system atrophy. What causes them to fall in PSP? You have to use your imagination a little. Yeah, it's vision. So like they, they can't really see where they're going properly sometimes, so they, they can fall in that as well. But yeah, MSA is more important for falls. And the last one, yeah, they literally trip because they can't see. It's just bad. Mm. Um, and the last one was corticobasal degeneration, and that has like one very classical finding. Does anyone know what it is? The alien limb phenomenon, yeah, they, they, they lose control of one of their limbs and it kind of goes wacky. Um, those are Parkinson's plus. They kind of come up in SBAs, that's about it. That's all you pretty much need to know about them, other than that, the fact that they're prognostically poor compared to regular Parkinson's disease. Fine. That is everything I wanted to talk about in terms of neuro. Does anyone want to talk about any other neuro 
today, as in we can cover stuff again. It's just me and Ahmed actually have teaching this week for the next three days. Um, how are they treated? So um, you don't really need to know badly. that. I think, yeah, badly. Like treatment doesn't work very well for them yeah. generally. It's just, they're badly treated. Yeah. They progress faster. Uh, just their prognosis, like Anush said, is quite poor. Yeah. Any questions about neuro? Did anyone want to talk about peripheral neuropathy? We've been talking for like two hours, so like, yeah, we'll say no to be honest. Oh, also one There's last. A... Oh wait, gone. Oh, so does all Parkinson's class have a poor response to levodopa? I believe so. I believe Gener they're all. They all generally, yeah. Because they've also got um, non non basal ganglia components. Yeah, um, and what was the other question? I've just lost it. Sorry, give me a second. Is Louis body dementia Parkinson's plus or separate? So, Louis body dementia has the same mechanism as Parkinson's disease. It's just with Louis in Louis body dementia, they have the dementia components first and then the movement disorder later, but this is Parkinson's disease where they get the movement disorder first. Yeah. Does that make sense? Um, can I ask you guys to fill out feedback? Because it's quite useful, because it tells us what we, we, we can cover on like Friday, for example. Mm. If you just hold up for one second, I'll give you a link. Whilst he's doing that, anybody know why levodopa becomes ineffective within five, sometimes 10 years? I shouldn't have asked that because I have access to the comments. Oops. Uh, I have access. I shall check in a minute. Um, resistance develops too much neuronal de degeneration. It's the neuronal yeah, degeneration. Perfect. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. If um, you lose the dopamine receptors, dopamine becomes useless. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, fill that out with session title season two, episode two. Um, obviously, like feedback is useful for us, but like if you were only going to fill out one section, make sure it's what else would you like to be covered? Mm. Yeah, no problem. Right. We have teaching, so we need to have lunch. Oh, yeah. Right. See you guys. See you guys. Thanks. I hope this was useful. How do I leave this call? Where is the button? <laughs> ah, there it is. Right. See you guys. Why is it not hanging up?